historical view and it answers the question, what is the future of the WTO? I'm really going to be talking about what we can learn from the past, the multilateral trading system, and how the current you know, differs from the gap before it. You take the broader view, you see that the nature of the trading system is almost always a reflection of the global distribution of power and wealth. And power and wealth have to be seen as being intimately related one with the other. If you want to be technical, I come from a school of thought that's called the theory of hegemonic stability. And that theory holds that we tend to have open markets when you have a hegemon. We tend to have closed markets when you don't. So we have the Pax Britannica, relatively open markets. We have the Pax Americana, relatively open or opening markets. We have the period between the Pax Britannica and Pax Americana, and relatively closed markets. Now, when you think about how we have changed over time, what we have today, we have a hegemonic challenge to American leadership and we learn from what we had during the gap period. Period, you had a commercial challenge from Japan, which was militarily weak. You had a military challenge from the Soviet Union, which was commercially almost non existent vis a vis the rest of the world. And today, we have a Sino American rivalry that's a full spectrum rivalry. The United States and China challenge one another both with respect to trade and in the security sphere. And so if you want to view it in that perspective, you see that the types of troubles that we face today are not entirely a reflection of a security challenge, but they are very heavily shaped by a security challenge that we have between the United States and China. So, two, three, two, three minutes at the beginning were missed through the recording. Okay. Just the Oh, just a very, very okay. Can you shoot me the mic? Oh, I'll speak to be very, very quick. Uh, I'm not going to pretend uh, that power and wealth are unrelated. I'm going to argue about power and wealth being intimately related. And the type of trading system that we have is a consequence of a global distribution of power and wealth. And seeing today the type of division we have between the United States and China. That we're facing and the challenges to that trading system. It's not the only one. So we inherit what we had in the gap. What we had in the gap was largely a north south split, but it was a north south split that was manageable. Uh, I have more experience uh, with managing that split than I do. Uh, nonetheless, it's one that we managed to get through. In the Tokyo round negotiations and the Uruguay round negotiations, we did not have an East West split during the gap period because we had almost no allies of the Soviet Union in the gap. There was Cuba from the start, there was Czechoslovakia from the start, both of them subsequently became allies of the Soviet Union. And we had Poland, Hungary, Romania acceded to the gap, but they were always rather marginal participants in the system. It's only when you get to the WTO period, the accessions of China uh, and in 2001 and the Russian Federation in 2012, and then also the accessions of the great majority of the former Soviet republics and all of the Eastern European countries that you begin to bring into the system, the countries that had been outside of the gap. Now, many of those countries have simply uh, uh, become NATO and members of the European Union as well, but not all of them. And what we see um, is largely that East-West split that didn't exist within the gap is now in the gap, it's just the borderline has moved progressively east and closer to Moscow than it was uh, within, the, uh, within the gap system. Okay, GAT can largely be seen as the commercial counterpart to NATO. And one of the reasons that GATT worked so well, notwithstanding the North-South split that had to be addressed, was there was a common strategic outlook on the third of the leading countries. And at least up until the Uruguay round negotiations from 1986 to 1994, all of the major decisions uh, within the GATT system, notwithstanding the fact the majority of contracting parties for developing countries 
So the great majority of the decisions were being made by in the paper that I've written and it's associated with the website here uh, that I call the North Atlantic Alliance. And the North Atlantic Alliance I would define as the United States, Canada, and any country that's either in the European Union or its predecessors or NATO. Most involved NATO and it's a Venn diagram, it's not absolutely one circle over the other. Operating a gas system in which there were important rules, but more significantly, some important norms that saw to it that the security issues, such as they did exist among uh, gas contracting parties, did not really intrude on what happened in the gas. So, those norms uh, did allow. The rules allowed for the negotiation of discriminatory agreements, including free trade agreements, but the norm that governed the negotiation of these free trade agreements was one that said, we will not negotiate discriminatory agreements between the major partners. So the United States and the European Union, for example, the United States and Japan, Japan and the European Union, dealt with one another in the GATT. They did not negotiate outside of the GATT any free trade agreement. That norm has been broken. We now have negotiations among the major partners, uh, which tends to detract from, from their commitment to the WTO. The major players uh, also ensured that we did not bring security disputes within the system. There were rules for dealing with security disputes, but there were also more importantly the norms for dealing with security issues. So one of those norms, which has weakened, was a norm of non-application. And one application rules said that any pair of countries, if they made this declaration at the right time, could pretend as if the other country was not in the system. And that meant that you could avoid uh, diplomatic embarrassments and dispute settlement with countries with which you had serious conflicts. Non-application was often invoked in the GATT system. It's very rarely invoked in the WTO system, which I find a shame because, in fact, we would be more honest if we invoked it more freely. Another norm governing a rule, if we have a security exception uh, in dispute settlement under Article 21, where uh, if a country wants to impose a measure that is otherwise in violation of its gas now WTO obligations for security purposes, the norm within the gap was that other countries would not challenge. And if they didn't challenge it, then the country invoked Article 21 saying we're doing this in pursuit of our essential security interests would not prove that. So unlike the general exceptions of um, GAF Article 20 that involve all sorts of environmental and so forth, if the country invokes that, you have to prove to a panel that in fact this is a correct invocation, and it was, it was a necessary measure to pursue that objective. And in fact, you often lose a case when you try to defend it under Article 20. In Article 21, national security exception, it was a get out of jail free card. That norm has just very recently been tossed out the window. Uh, we had a Ukraine-Russian dispute in which a panel for the first time has now ruled on whether a country's invocation of its national security objectives uh, would be automatically accepted. What instead has to be reviewed, I argue that leads us down a road we may not want to go, because although the previous system was based upon the assumption that we had shared security commercial outlook among the major players, and no one was going to abuse uh, the national security assumption, therefore we didn't need to Proven when we do involvement in the current environment, you might argue that we must have differing security views. It's necessary to begin examining countries in relation to national security. I would argue it makes it all the more necessary not to challenge them because the other threat is that if a country feels outranked by a review of its national security invocation, it may say that's about you know, like one of us going home. So these are important respects in which the expanding membership uh, of the WTO and the inclusion in the WTO of countries that have very differing views uh, on security issues has changed in fundamental ways. 
relationship between countries. Now, if you want the numbers on this, I'm not going to bore people with numbers. Uh, I, I try to quantify in my paper uh, the percentage of the GDP, the global GDP that is represented uh, in through GATT and in the WTO uh, by NATO members and even countries that are militarily affiliated. You'll see the numbers there, but the real watershed in 2012. 2012 is the year that Russia joins, the Russian Federation joins the WTO. Uh, and it's also the year that NATO countries account for less than half of the GDP represented in the system. So uh, another issue that I, I find fascinating is the United States and the European Union had within this cooperative framework in which they had a, a, a common view of uh, uh, collective security and mutual prosperity is reflected in NATO and GAP did not prevent us from suing one another. And uh, there are a great many of the dispute settlement cases that took place in the late GAP period and in the early WTO period were US versus EU cases. And I try to quantify in the paper how we have gone from there being heavily weighted in dispute settlement going from US EU cases to East West cases, that is to say, the United States or other North American or North Atlantic alliance countries in disputes with either Russia or China. And I don't want people to misinterpret what I'm arguing here. I'm not arguing that the fact that we have gone from intra North Atlantic alliance cases to East West cases is bad because we have too many East West cases. We shouldn't have East West cases. I would argue that we have too few in the North Atlantic Alliance cases. It's a simple counterintuitive argument, but what I am suggesting is that both with respect to the agreements we negotiate and the disputes that we have with another, countries that had been the founding uh, burdens to the GATT have gradually been moving away from the WTO as the arena in which we manage our commercial relations. And if the United States and the European Union are no longer suing one another and no longer negotiating exclusively within that sphere, it becomes more and more uh, that the WTO is perceived, certainly in Washington and elsewhere, I think as well, as the place that we're confronting China, which is problematic. Uh, it's problematic for the sustainability of, of the system. I want to leave a lot of time for discussion, so I'm just going to uh, mention one other issue here and then turn it back for, for discussion. And that is why it is the consequences of moving from multilateral negotiations to discriminatory negotiations. Anyone who follows the trading system is aware that the go around is essentially down to another thing that's down a death certificate. Uh, I don't blame that on the East West split the, the the demise of the Doha round, which was launched in 2001, really is attributable in large measure uh, to the North South split in the first place. But I would argue that there are two things that we would have done by now, if not for the declining interest of the United States and the European Union in maintaining and revitalizing the WTO system. We would have solved the dispute settlement issue that we have over the appellate body membership. And we would have solved the Doha round. But uh, the, I won't go into the appellate body issue because it's rather complicated. But the Doha round, I think, increasingly is viewed as that round that would benefit primarily China and not the United States, the European Union, and our FTA allies. Because whenever we negotiate a free trade agreement, we are creating a vested interest in maintaining the margins of preference that are extended to our FTA allies. Uh, and I say allies deliberately because, at least in the case of the United States, the countries with which we choose to negotiate free trade agreements are more often selected for political and security reasons than they are for purely commercial reasons. You just have to look at the list of our, of our 20 partners to see how that is the case. And the, each new negotiation creates an economic and a political disincentive to concluding the Delta round. We have gotten in a position where the United States and China were very effectively competing with one another as to who will have the most and uh, uh, most significant free trade agreements. The United States, for the time being, is not engaging in, in those negotiations because the Biden administration, I think, is 
reach the sensible conclusion that it's not going to be able to get uh, uh, Congress to approve any new free trade agreements that it might negotiate. So for the time being, uh, we're in a, in a state of stasis. Right after China has overtaken the United States, both in terms of total FTA partners and in the economic, the aggregate economic size uh, of the FTA partners. And increasingly, uh, we are seeing uh, the movement of the United States and the European Union and China to initiatives that are side of, of that multilateral framework and for reasons, again, delved into in greater depth in, in the paper. I don't see any change in that coming. Or to put it uh, in good political science terms, the problem with the WTO system is exogenous to the trading system. It is the larger political security, diplomatic environment in which we operate. And if you try to solve the WTO problem by thinking only endogenously to the system, could we have better rules? Could we have a better way of negotiating? Could we tweak our our, our legal procedures, I think you're missing the larger picture. And the larger picture is one where, to get back where I started, uh, if you consider the trading system as being shaped primarily by the global distribution of power and wealth, we have a distribution today that leans much more heavily towards chaos, trivial forces, than it does to cooperation and some trivial forces. Thank you very much, Craig. I give the floor immediately to Dr. Bill for his own comments. Uh, warm greetings to all friends and colleagues. Uh, after reading Craig's chapter, I sent him a message saying that I was so much in agreement with every word that he wrote that I would be in trouble finding something of mine to add. His is the very best and the most thoughtful analysis I've read of the current predicament WTO finds itself in as a result of a geopolitical deterioration and the priority given to security concerns over trade and other multilateral methods. I fully share his views and his conclusions seem likely and reasonable to me. Having said so, I will confine my comments to different aspects that were not covered in his chapter and that may perhaps add to the complexity of the situation without altering the essential elements in Craig's analysis. They fall mainly into two categories. First, the suspicion, not the certainty, the suspicion that the WTO MTS, as Craig calls it, uh, was already giving signs of exhaustion in purely trade negotiation terms, even before the geopolitical situation worsened. And secondly, that besides national security concerns, matters related to fighting global warming in an effective and a national way are almost as complicated to deal with in the current WTO framework as security concerns themselves. Uh, to understand the first item, we should go back to the phase before the launching of the Doha Round. The first few years after WTO came into being, roughly coincident with the second half of the 1990s, were extremely productive in terms of the interests and expectations of advanced economies. They practically exhausted all items uncover left uncovered by the Uruguay round. Uh, first, the agreement on basic telecommunication service, the agreement 
on financial service, culminating with the information technology products agreement uh, starting at the 1996 Singapore WTO ministerial meeting. The USTR said then that after these results, maybe it would no longer be necessary to have negotiation rounds as WTO uh, had become a sort of a permanent negotiating forum. The trouble was that as a consequence of the Uruguay round, there had been a commitment to address uh, agriculture and services in new negotiations. Feeling that services was not in itself enough to counterbalance the pressure for concessions in agriculture, it was the European Trade Commissioner, Sir Leon Britton, you remember him, uh, who first insisted on the need for a new round, initially rebuked by the USA and most other partners. There was a feeling at the time that the major advanced trade partners had already got most of what they wanted, including in the new issues, mainly trips and services. And they had reached the limits of what they were willing to concede in traditional matters of a trade liberalization. What had been left outside the liberalization process, mainly agriculture and the so-called unfinished business of the Tokyo round, tariff picks, tariff escalation, anti-dumping, abuse, etc., were out of reach for the time being and remain so to this day. The situation only changed after 9-11, and even then there was no excess of enthusiasm, to say the least, in the launching of the Doha Brown. I was there as UNCTAD Secretary General and as the representative of Kofi Annan. I could personally see as developing countries were cajoling into agreeing to the launching of the round with the promises that their long-standing grievances would finally be considered in a round called Development Round for Public Relations Goals. I myself have never used that expression. Such was the lack of a faith in the promise that I compared Doha to the predicament of the Austrians after the defeat in the First World War. They were forced by the victors to become an independent country when they just wanted to join the Germans in the Anschluss before, of course, the Nazi Anschluss. No? The, 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 the round that nobody wanted reminded me of uh, the nation nobody wanted. One should not forget that when in 2007, 2008, there was a possibility of concluding the Doha round after Brazil and the European Union had reached a deal regarding agricultural liberalization. It was the opposition of the United States on the one hand and of India and China on the other that actually buried the attempt, condemning the round to fail. It is interesting to observe that at that point, security concerns or geopolitics played no role at all. The deadlock at the appellate body dates back from the same time. 
This seems to suggest to me that even if the geo geopolitical situation by miracle were much more harmonious, it might not be enough to allow for WTO to promote liberalization in the issues that had never been in the interest of most advanced economies, particularly in agriculture and the unfinished business of the Tokyo Bank. This is, of course, a perspective coming for, from a former Brazilian negotiator, which is quite different from the prevailing views of the developed parties. Uh, my second point, and I will be very brief on that, is regarding the difficulty of uh, keeping the rules of WTO and the fighting global warming, at least from the perspective of some people. You know, I was quite struck two days ago in reading Paul Krugman's blog, because he was putting things in uh, quite an alarming uh, situation. Uh, he uh, actually said, either we cook the planet or we keep the rules of the WTO. Uh, of course, what he wanted to say was that the American Act uh, fighting inflation, in reality, it's not to fight inflation is to promote industrial policy, uh, to promote industrial uh, electric cars, etc. Uh, he acknowledges that this is not the best uh, approach, that the best approach would be to approve a carbon tax, but he admits a carbon tax is politically not feasible. So, uh, what remains is uh, to adopt a law that is clearly protectionist and violates uh, WTO rules and, of course, uh, is causing a lot of a reaction from the Europeans. So, uh, as we can see, this is in total absence, in abstraction of a geopolitical consideration. He's only dealing with the problems of a fighting global warming. How to fight global warming? Uh, keeping the framework of rules, the current framework of rules of WTO. So those are the two points I would like to leave with you. I think there are others, but my own impression, and I insist on that, is that the multilateral trading system was already showing signs of exhaustion, even before geopolitical concerns uh, did uh, took the, 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 the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ricopero. Uh, what would you like to proceed, Craig? Would you like to take? Questions or react immediately to go to recover and questions after? Let, let me react. All right. Questions. I really do not disagree with Dr. Recupero. I think we would both agree that solving both the north south split and the east west split is necessary if the WTO is to get to yes. The only question is whether one believes that it's principle and whether it also be sufficient. And that depends on whether you are an optimist or a, or a realist. But yes, I definitely agree that the North-South split was very significant in the GATT and remains significant in the WTO and was a sign of difficulty early on. I was saying we're, we're, we're ripping too much, so they both have to be resolved. We want to go ahead more flatly. Thank you. Uh, for now, I have three uh, questions, if I'm not mistaken. Nivesha, then not one, then Rashid, and maybe three or two or one by one, and then you That's fine. That's yeah, I always feel that, that, that former students have, have 
favorable position, they get to ask the first question. <laughs> When you had your division of the world on uh, NATO with the um, overlapping circles uh, between NATO and, and, and uh, EU plus and so on, um, that leaves the world um, half done, let's say. Well, A, there is the north-south uh, general dictate that somehow uh, I was missing, but now we discussed it. Um, but then it leaves out the whole, whole of the Pacific. It leaves out Asia and, and Australia um, as powers and players. And I was wondering whether you saw that was the potential of solutions of um, uh, maybe uh, weakening the, the, the tough polarization we currently see uh, through other players such as Asia or the Pacific. Then we have four former students. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. It's always a pleasure to hear um, from the scientists talking about trade by the film. My question is from whole speech. It's clear that uh, there are two things that we can see. First is the uh, obsession. Uh, US on the uh, challenge issue. And the fact that China is at the center of geography and the visual devices for the for all uh, kinds of problems. And then we also uh, understand that we can help to keep the geopolitical view not only in the view. Uh, in this context, do you think that uh, finding ways to remove Dropping uh, status to China, particular move to break the network that I know was a cascade that uh, will solve all kinds of issues. Even we will find a way to convince China of the post and not to 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 let the side uh, it's the dropping country status. Two more? One more? One. Rashid, then we can move on. Thank you very much. Again, it's uh, reading the paper. Uh, Greg was, was fascinating. And uh, I think it was very really useful. And here we are in the middle of all the various trade negotiators. And before we even know the political knowledge side. I had two points. I think one was already covered by uh, Mr. Dubro and always covers everything. And then you already speak. So I don't need to belabor the point that okay, I do feel that North South is quite important. But building on your response to that, maybe in a different way, another paper or written iteration of that, maybe even from your critical perspective, it would be interesting to see how to see that South playing through the areas of this world. And so that would be an interesting angle to know. Now, uh, there's a lot in the paper, I agree, and particularly that geopolitical angle is quite important. But building on a bit on, on what Anton just said, and I guess despite not being a student, maybe we are friends, so I got something from him. So <laughs> let me be provocative as not making a move in the WTO, particularly by the US. That's or fear of that China will be the only benefit or the major benefit. Is it really the truth? Because if you look at China and Russia behavior, let me start with first with Russian Federation of the Ukraine war and what was happening in the WTO and Russian uh, diplomats were not, others were not even willing to so when willing to talk with them, uh, they had to be separated, and so on and so forth. And that is not to be. The Shia behave with no responsibility. It could have used this consensus building decision making to talk by the, the last ministerial. They could have said, okay, we don't agree with the PE subsidy negotiation. Keep us out. Do not see any such thing. Similarly, for China, despite a strong saying, oh, yeah, we are a developing country, we do see. When it was needed 
the suggestion of removing developing country status, since I imagine you're well aware, the United States takes the position that this should no longer be a matter of self-declaration and China is by no means the only developing country uh, for which the United States insists that that, uh, that step would have to be taken. Of course, when it comes to national policies, our preferential programs we can define who is a developing country or a less developed country, however, we're. so when it comes to um, our treatment of African countries, for example, uh, we do extend LDC treatment to South African countries, and they're not LDCs. Uh, but all of these issues have to be seen through a domestic political lens. I don't think that, first of all, removing China developed country status would have any impact on the U.S. approach to China within a Geneva context, I see how it would affect uh, the treatment of China by other countries within Geneva, but I don't think that that would really affect the positions taken by uh, by U.S. negotiators. So, pardon me if I if I revert to being U.S. centric on these things, but it is it is one gut instinct. Uh, so, Rashid, uh, let me do that in answer to your question as well. Sometimes I'll say that. Uh, in the analysis that I have been working on for the larger book, I am increasingly seeing India as a critical player. Yesterday, people have been wrong and can testify that I, I said yesterday that 100 years from now, when some successor of mine looks at, at the history of training policy in the latter half of, of the 21st century, uh, India will figure very prominently in the direction we take. Now, what role exactly India plays uh, and, and what direction the trading system takes is a lot of most parts there. But very significantly, India is beginning to play a role both in the numbers commercially and in diplomatic initiatives that are more commensurate with its manipulation and its overall GDP than had been the case uh, in the past. Now, uh, the question of, um, I'm trying to see my notes here. Uh, you had asked not only the role of, of India and other developing countries, certainly um, they have choices to make and, and have influence and are going to expand on the influence that they have already. Uh, you had asked the question of whether it really is the case uh, that China is, would be viewed as the unique beneficiary. That was your point. Uh, again, from a U.S. perspective, let me give you a few numbers, some of which are included in the in the paper, others not. As of last year, 36% of U.S. imports came from FTA countries. The United States is not currently actively negotiating FTAs with the European Union, the United Kingdom, and Japan, but has been engaged in such negotiations on an on and off basis uh, for, for quite a number of years. In the event that we ever do conclude those negotiations, far in excess of 50% of U.S. imports will come from FTA partners, and China will account for something like two-thirds of the remaining imports, that is to say, WTO countries that we do not have FTAs with. Um, even before we get to that critical point, however, I would say that when you talk to people in Congress and in other decision-making bodies in the United States, the WTO is increasingly seen as that place where we deal with China. And uh, I would just remind that um, we first such a position once before, and it was in 1950, 1951, when Congress forced the Truman administration to withdraw and treatment from the Soviet Union and other countries in its orbit, because the argument was made at that time, because these countries get MFM treatment, any reduction in tariffs is done on a multilateral basis will benefit them. Now, that was a silly argument at the time because we had very little trade with the Soviet Union. It's not such a silly argument today because we have so much trade with China. And as long as MFN tariff reductions are viewed as principally benefiting China, it's a very, very hard sell to make them in the U.S. Congress. Uh, I would like to uh, um, to come out of a question and then Dr. Ipukur, I'm sure that you have also comments and reactions to these questions. And then this one can come up. Um, thank you. Um, I worked for many years with WPO and 
I'd like to ask you as an eminent historian of the women's scout, how do you view now a posteriori the fact that the developing countries and LDC agreed to the TRIPS agreement as it was then? And uh, what is uh, a mistake, so to say, uh, in other words, is it true that as I read in so many Books about this issue that uh, in the preparation for the uh, in the negotiation during the Uruguay Grand negotiation of the trips, there were non developing countries, practically only Brazil, India, and to some extent South Africa, who had the resources and the knowledge of, of the matter in order to be able to be represented in Geneva during the negotiation, having people in, in present in the negotiation and also understanding all the issues that were being discussed. And uh, I mean, in spite of the concessions that were made about the time for that legislation and for NDC and for developing countries ourselves, uh, well, what is your uh, judgment a posteriori or what happened there? Thank you. Then maybe Simonetta, would you like to raise your question now? Um, I mean, I'm afraid, yeah, to raise your voice, we might be here, so. I have a question back in the ambassador for the ambassador. Yes, he's only here. Okay, so to clarify, uh, could you please just expand a bit on this uh, only case, uh, Pana case, uh, uh, based on Article 21? You mentioned that it was the Russian Federation and Ukraine, so to explain what was uh, the issue and the welcome. And to our master, the question is uh, uh, there is this idea of a peace truce so that the countries uh, that uh, take measures uh, that would otherwise be consistent with the community obligations, but if these measures were meant to, to find a kind of change, these measures should be asked. So, Please close this up and something them. What this uh, make since uh, uh, Ambassador Kukanov uh, pointed out of the uh, uh, climate change as an, uh, another uh, another issue that may make the WTO collapse even further, would the, um, this peace clause uh, help or even make the WTO imagining assuming that this peace clause is a very distance that is a very long time, is something that would make the WTO weaker or two excellent questions. Well, there's two different ways to do the balance sheet. Uh, one is to ask, should we have stricter enforcement and then that gets all about the relative value of creating new drugs, which the cost of existing drugs and so forth. And in my WTO history, the history of future world free organization, which is available online free from the WTO, uh, I discussed that at some length. Because I was writing an official document, I didn't describe the TRIPS agreement as a drug deal document. Um, that's sometimes what I what I think of it as. But uh, beyond that, another way of thinking about it is Tamil the game. What was in exchange for? And it was in exchange for or it's the end of the MFA clause. And that's where I think developing countries very clearly made a bad miscalculation. Because there was a general belief that the quota system that we had in place will teach them apparently fiber arrangements uh, when we strengthen their treatment. And in retrospect, for the great majority of developing countries, it was guaranteeing their trade, guaranteeing market share. And what we've seen since the phase out of the LFA bonus between 1995 and 2005, and then in the period since then where they're, where they're no longer in effect, uh, is the market has been captured by the most efficient producers, which is to say China, and India, um, uh, Asia, Vietnam, and through four other countries. And it does countries that used to rely on this European court accident and found that they just cannot compete any longer. So 
even though I'm not a big fan of uh, control markets and quota rents and all of that, from a strictly mercantilist point of view, it was a bad miscalculation on the developing countries. And I think many of them regret having made the deal, not just on the question of, of how much tuberculosis drugs cost, and these things have been subsequently adjusted uh, through renegotiation. Of the trust agreement, you can argue whether it's been fully um, But I think that the exchange was a bad one from the perspective of the great majority of developing countries. Uh, just very quickly, the the uh Ukraine case was one involving GAP Article 5, which is freedom of transit. So you know, well before we actually had a shooting war between Russia, the Russian Federation and Ukraine, we had all sorts of steps that they were taking against one another, including Russian restrictions on the movement of Ukrainian goods through Russian territory. Uh, this was challenged in the WTO. Uh, Russia uh, invoked Article 21. And interestingly, the two countries that argued most strongly in favor of the position that this should be self-judging and a panel should not look at it because this has been the policy up until that time were right there. That mm -hmm. makes sense. But that's in a reflection, not just the fact that the Trump administration at the time often wanted to abuse uh, its, its, its market power and, and the loophole of, of Article 21, uh, but also it's, a, it's an established US position that we want to keep security issues out of the WTO. It's not the only Article 21 case. There also is a very complicated one involving the Gulf states, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and the Free by Saudi Arabia in the case. Well, this, this is the high profile. We would like to give the floor to Dr. Rick Cooper also because one of the two questions by Simonetta was uh, reacting to his comment, but also if he has additional comments on the questions that were already made. Please, Dr. Ricubin. Thank you, Manuela. Uh, I have nothing more to add. Uh, I'm very pleased with the answers. Uh, and I think we, from, from, from my part, uh, I really don't have any, any new points to raise. Thank you very much. First question concerning, um, or well, harking back to what you said at the end of your talk, that uh, in a sense, uh, what is the guiding force behind the multilateral trading system or the international trading system is more power relations and geopolitics than economics. Okay. Uh, but uh, I think that the, the relationship between these two schemes can get complicated and they often do. Why? Because uh, the United States likes to frame this East-West conflict as the conflict between democracies against the authoritarian states, autocracies, etc., etc. But at the same time, uh, you have countries which are well, imperfect democracies, etc., uh, which have very strong trade ties with China which do not necessarily want to be aligned with either of these countries. I mean, this could be the case of Australia, could be the case of uh, India, to the extent of Turkey. <laughs> so how do you see the interplay between uh, the political profile of countries, uh, their geopolitical interests, and their economic interests? Uh, again, to, to relate it to other answers I've given before, this is something that has been much more uh, prominent in the approval of trade agreements than in the negotiation of trade agreements. So, uh, take the case of the United States, when it selects a country with whom to negotiate a free trade agreement, uh, the political issues that are taken into account, predominantly the issues of foreign policy, when the agreement goes to Congress for approval, the predominant issues, uh, political issues, will be the domestic politics of, of the country. I find it fascinating that um, when both the US Colombia and US Korea FTAs were under consideration, despite the fact that the US Korean FTA uh, involved much more trade 
much more than the U.S. colonial entity and involved more trade in the currently specific problems with which the United States would compete with Korea. Nonetheless, there was much more opposition and a far greater likelihood of rejecting ultimately was not rejected by Congress, but a greater likelihood of rejection of the U.S. Colombian FTA because of the domestic political situation in Colombia, especially with respect to um, labor leader assassinations and other issues related to labor rights. Uh, so you have to think about these issues, not just respect, with respect to with whom do we negotiate, but with whom do we agree uh, to improve the results of our negotiation. Here's that. There's an example of that into um, but the WTO is, of course, a very different animal than is the European Union, if I can change focus for a moment. If you want to join the European Union, um, there are certain political prerequisites about having a, uh, a democratic institutions in place of rule of law and so forth. That is not obligatory uh, in the WTO, and certainly we have had accession by countries that fall far short of what we would hope they have in, in terms of rule of law and democracy and, and so forth. But the more we negotiate FTAs, um, the more prominent those types of issues will be, unless you're talking about negotiating with a country that places less emphasis on those issues. Um, and certainly, uh, if we are heading towards a system where countries have to choose Am I going to negotiate my FTA with the United States or am I going to negotiate with China? There are some countries that might feel excluded from negotiations with the United States, and so that will affect the uh, things they have for negotiating with China. Thank you, Craig. I don't have questions here in the chat comment. I believe there are other questions or comments, either by Dr. Ricoubre or here in the room. Please feel free. Otherwise, uh, we can continue, of course, here the discussion uh, with some wine and stimulate more comments. And to show, particularly after the second class, but I'm sorry, we cannot share the wine in the chat with those on Zoom. Uh, you will find the recording of this great talk uh, on uh, the website crisis.ch. Uh, early next week, the uh, editor and the paper, as I handed the paper. By Craig is already posted in the same website. Oh, no. so we really want to, to thank you very much, you, Professor Carsten, and our honorary president in Brazil. Uh, really, thank you very much for having this, uh, th this session. You know, I was really very impressed because this is not at all my field. I'm a naturally and I work with probabilities and stochastic, stochastic processes. And I noticed that some of my colleagues in the US in Florida and some of them joined. I might be a bit less plus as I am, because I found that it's extremely complex what we are dealing with. And so we're going back to probabilities and pragmatic process. Things seem simple compared to what you are doing real quick. So really thank you, thank you so much to both of you. And I hope that those that have a saying in the decisions and then the conducting of all the very complex processes that put together so many variables will have a wisdom and will read your forthcoming book. Thank you to all of you and a good afternoon, good evening in China, and good morning in Latin America. Bye -bye. <laughs>